For all of you signing in, the webinar will begin in just a few minutes. We will start the webinar in just about one minute. All right, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for the Interviewing in a Virtual World webinar. My name is Brittany Leland. I am the Director of Career Education. Before we begin, I do want to point out that closed captioning is available and you can find that by clicking the CC closed captioning button at the bottom of your screen. I would also like to point out that we do have the Q&A function available during this webinar. So if you have any questions as we go through, please feel free to type them in. Uh, we will be saving the Q&A portion for the end of the webinar, but please ask questions as you have them. And then we will try to get through as many as possible at the end of our content today. All right, so. Today, we are going to be focusing on three main goals for um, our participants in the webinar. The first one is for you to have a better understanding of the different types of virtual interviews that you might encounter in the application process. Then we're gonna talk about how best to prepare for a virtual interview and, and how that might be a little bit different uh, than it would if you were preparing for an in-person or a phone interview. And then finally, we're just gonna go over some general interview preparation regarding questions. Um, and, and that portion of our webinar will actually be fairly applicable to any type of an interview, uh, whether that is in person, virtual or telephone. So there are, are really two big types of, of interviews that are conducted virtually. And those two categories are live, and asynchronous or recorded. So I'm going to ask a question via the polling function now. And if everybody could respond, that would be great. Um, what is your experience with virtual interviews? Uh, so you can indicate if you have had a virtual interview or interview with a live interviewer, um, if you've had maybe a recorded or asynchronous interview, um, maybe you've done both, maybe you've done neither, maybe you're not sure which you've done, you know you've done something, but you're not sure which one it is. Um, it looks like our, our votes are coming in here. I'll give it just a few more minutes, or not minutes, seconds. Um, looks like we've got a, a fair number of um, responses. So we'll go ahead and end the polling. And let's take a look at these results here. So it looks like we have um, quite a few people who haven't had a, a virtual interview experience yet. Um, we've also had some folks who've done some live interviewing um, and a few that have done the, the recorded or asynchronous. Um, 
a few who've done both. So um, some of this will be new information uh, for you regarding the different types of virtual interviews. Some of, some of you might find this to be a bit of a refresher, um, but we'll start with diving into what is a, what is a live interview, a live virtual interview. Um, this is what we often think of when we think of live virtual interviews. It is conducted through a platform that it could be Zoom, it could be Skype, it could be Google Hangouts, it could be some other platform that allows for that video interface. Um, but it is typically uh, with one or more interviewers who are live on the other end of the interview. So they are engaging with you, they are asking you questions and in real time and you're answering and you're able to respond. You can usually see them if everybody's video uh, equipment is working. And so you have some of that ability to see their nonverbals, to see maybe when they're taking notes, when they're smiling, nodding, you have that benefit. So in some ways there are some similarities to in-person interviews and live virtual interviews. Obviously there's the screen that, that creates a little bit of distance, but um, it's just like really any other Skype or Zoom call that you might be on very common. The other type of virtual interview is called an asynchronous virtual interview and these were actually starting to become popular in the last few years. We've seen a lot of larger organizations move towards using this um, as a kind of a screening interview, a first round interview. And now with COVID-19 we're seeing um, an increase in all different types of, of virtual interviews but asynchronous is certainly one of those that has seen a bump. And what this is, is it's a chance for you to answer interview questions, but there's nobody on the other end. There's no live interviewer asking you questions. Um, really what happens is they will send you a link, usually via an email, and you will click on the link. It will take you to a site where you will start the interview. It will give you a question, and these questions have been pre-selected by the interviewer. Um, once the question is popped up, then your your camera will turn on. It will record your answer. Um, there might be multiple questions you have to answer, or there might just be one or two. Um, once it's done recording those answers, the interview's over, those, those recordings are saved, and they're then sent to the recruiter or the hiring manager who can access them whenever they wish. Um, so it, it's a little, it feels a little bit different. It's, it's definitely a different process to be talking to a camera and not to have any nonverbal feedback, to not be able to see the person. Um, and so I always like to make sure that students are aware that this is a, a common type of, of virtual interview. Uh, now the benefit to the employer is that they only have to do that screening interview, that initial interview once. Um, and then if there are multiple jobs or multiple hiring managers within the organization who are interested in you as a candidate, that recruiter can send all of them the link to that same initial interview and they're able to, to watch it and share it as many times as they want, rather than having to re-screen you every time a new hiring manager would be interested. Um, but again, the drawback to the interviewee is that it's a, it's a very different process and it can feel a little, bit, um, a little bit awkward at first. Now, there are some um, programs that employers use and, and um, you may have had this experience that it will allow you to practice before you do the real interview process. Um, they may also set it up so that you can answer more than once if you wanna re-record an answer. Um, sometimes they'll allow you multiple chances, but um, everybody can set their system up differently. So in my opinion, it's better to be prepared um, for not having any chance to practice and not having any chance to re-record and then if you do have the opportunity, if their system does allow that, then that's kind of a nice surprise. But asynchronous, definitely becoming more and more popular, definitely important to be prepared for. So now that we know the, the two different types of virtual interviews that you might run into, let's talk about how you can be prepared for uh, the virtual interview, regardless of whether it's live or asynchronous. And obviously with a virtual interview, we are leaning heavily on our tech. So you'd like to make sure that all of your technology is ready to go before the interview. Um, I will say that especially in this rather unique time that we're in, um, folks tend to be fairly uh, lenient with, with understanding that we're not in an ideal situation. 
Um, a lot of us are, are at home trying to make these, these virtual interviews work. And so it can sometimes be harder to find uh, a place where you're by yourself, where it's totally quiet, um, or where you have a really strong internet connection. And so I think that folks understand the complexity of that and, again, are willing to be a little bit more lenient. Um, but still, we want to try to reduce the possibility of anything going wrong so that you, as the interviewee, can feel more comfortable and less stressed out. So definitely want to um, make sure that our technology is, is as good as possible. Um, obviously, a big part of that is going to be your internet connection. If possible, and it, you, you have access to this, we recommend that you plug your, your laptop or computer directly into an ethernet port so that it's not, you're not relying on the Wi-Fi, which can be sometimes a little bit un, uh, unreliable, unreliable depending on where you're at or what your connection is like. Um, but again, if all you have is Wi-Fi and your Wi-Fi is good, then I, I don't think I would worry too much about it. I will encourage you to make sure that wherever you are using the Wi-Fi, that you've tested that the Wi-Fi works in that exact spot. Uh, I know personally for me, when we moved to uh, working from home with COVID-19, my Wi-Fi in my house was great and I thought I would have no problem um, no matter where I was. And then I, I moved into a different part of the house that had a, was a slightly less distracting area and uh, realized fairly quickly that the internet was not very good there. Um, and I'm certainly in a few Zoom calls where my, my call was dropped. So try it out first, make sure that, that it's a good solid place for your Wi-Fi. Um, also, make sure that your camera is working, that it's turned on, that you're comfortable with that. And then your microphone, that it's picking you, picking up your voice. It's not picking up a lot of other sounds. Um, you will notice today that I am wearing a, um, some headphones that I have plugged into my laptop. It does have a little microphone right on the cord here, so you can hear my voice a little bit more clearly than if I wasn't plugged in. That's a really good option. Um, if you have wireless headphones that connect to your laptop, you can use that as well just helps the sound quality a little bit. Certainly not required, but something to think about, a headset or microphone um, or um, headphones if you have them. All right, so once your technology is all set and you're ready to go there, you wanna make sure that your surroundings are, are ready. Um, and the two that I would like to talk about here are your background and any noise that you have around you. So you'll notice that I have a background set up. I'm not actually on campus sitting in front of the tower right now. Uh, this is a, a Zoom background that I have set up. A lot of folks use these, it's very common, and it can be a really nice way of just making sure there's nothing distracting behind you. Um, I choose to use them because um, I think it's just, it, it makes everything look a little bit cleaner. I have a dog who's running around the house and I don't want her to be seen in the back of my, my screen. So this um, helps me with that. There are a few things to note when you have a Zoom background on. One of them is that motion can be kind of tricky. So if I'm moving and using my hands a lot, see how they kind of disappear into the background? Um, that can be really distracting. So if you are using a background, make sure that you're not moving around quite as much. Now you don't have to use a background and actually I'm going to go ahead and turn off my background for just a second because I want to show you um, that even if you have a, uh, a room or a space that's not um, overly distracting, it still can be a little bit of, uh, of a distraction to the viewer. So if I don't have my background on, you can now see I'm sitting in a spare bedroom. You can see that there's a door open behind me. You might be wondering, it's down that hallway. Is there anybody in there? Is there her dog running around she just mentioned? Um, you can see I have a closet over here. You might be trying to see what's in that closet. And so you start to, to look around um, me trying to figure out what's going on, maybe make some assumptions about who I am or, or where, where I live. Um, so again, totally up to you, but I think if you, if you have a nice background that's not too distracting that you feel comfortable with, um, always a good idea to, to toss that on there. The other thing to watch out for is noise. And like I said before, employers very much realize that we are all at home and we are probably at home with others, whether those are other people or animals or um, neighbors or roommates um, who might be making noise. So as much as you can give folks a heads up to, to try to stay quiet while you're on the interview, that would be beneficial. But um, you also want to make sure that you are reducing 
noise that you might be causing unintentionally. So a few years ago, I was doing a practice virtual interview with a student and um, as he was answering every few answers, I would hear a, a rather loud and, and odd jingling sound and I couldn't quite figure out what was happening. He was in a study room in the library, so I, I couldn't think of what might be making that noise. And at the end of the interview, I asked him, did you hear jingling? What was happening? And he, he had not heard it. And it took us a, a few minutes, but we finally realized that what was happening is that he had his laptop on the desk in front of him and he was wearing a metal watch. And as he was thinking of his answers, he would move his arms, kind of, you know, tapping them, um, fidgeting a little bit, and it would knock against the desk and the jingling of his watch strap on the desk was getting picked up quite loudly by the microphone on the laptop. Um, so there are just a few things like that where never in a million years would you think I need to take off my watch before I go to an interview, but with a Zoom interview, maybe I make sure I take off any jewelry or anything that might make noises if I'm moving around. Um, so just being really aware of, of what is happening and practicing before the interview can be helpful in reducing um, some distractions regarding uh, background and noise. All right, so once you've got your tech set up, you've got your settings the way that you want them, now it's time to think about how you're presenting yourself. The first thing I wanna point out here is that you do wanna dress for this as if it was an in-person interview. You want your attire to be um, appropriate for an interview setting, and, and that's probably going to be business professional or potentially business casual. It depends on your industry and the organization, but it's always nice to dress up um, nicer, certainly nicer than you would if you were working there, if you got the job. And uh, it's important because it conveys that you're taking the interview seriously, especially in this virtual world. It's important for them to know that you are um, able to be professional from a, a distance, from a, from a home office or a virtual setting. Now, camera view is, is another thing that I've seen folks um, underestimate every now and again. And a lot of times it's because we're using a laptop and our laptops are usually on a table in front of us with the screen kind of pointed back, angled up at our face so we can type and, and see the screen well. But what happens is when you turn on the camera and that's where your laptop is, the camera is likely shooting directly up your nose for, for lack of a better way of describing that. And that's not the best angle. So what you wanna think about is, is creating a view that is similar to what you might see uh, with a newscaster, right? If they zoom in on the newscaster and they're giving their story, You'll typically see, you know, mid, mid arm length up above. Um, there's not going to be too much dead space above their head. You'll be able to see their face well. Um, it's not just their face, right? It's zoomed out a little bit um, and it's, it's at eye level. The camera is at eye level. Um, so this is probably going to require you to get some books or some boxes or something to stack up underneath your laptop um, if you are seeing that your, your angle is a little bit low. Um, the other thing that I want to mention here is the lighting. You want to make sure that the lighting source is behind your laptop or your camera and is not, you don't want it to be behind you. So sitting directly in front of a window might be kind of hard because the window is going to be really bright and it's going to probably put your face in shadow. It's going to look dark. Um, so sitting in front of a window, uh, sitting facing a window with your laptop directly in front of the window, that can be a really good light source. If you don't have a window, you don't have access to that, um, you can just grab a lamp and set it up directly behind your laptop so it's shining into your face and that's gonna create some brightness there and that's a really good way to, to get that set up. Um, as you're speaking, you want to remember to look in the camera as much as possible. This is going to feel weird because it means you're looking at the little light on your on your laptop or your camera instead of looking into the face of the interviewer and it's certainly normal to look at the the screen to see their reaction and their response and it's it's definitely not the end of the world if you find yourself looking at their face but as much as you can try to remember to look up at that camera because then it's going to feel like you're making eye contact with them that you're engaging with them um, and that's going to present really well the other thing that I like to mention here that students sometimes have questions about um, are written notes. Can I have notes with me if I'm on a Skype interview or, or a virtual interview? And my answer to that is that it's, it's really hard to not look like you're reading notes. 
Um, if I have a piece of paper in front of me and I go like this to look at it, you can clearly see that I'm looking down, right? Um, or if I'm looking over here because I've taped something up and I'm reading some notes, you can see that I've shifted. Um, and so I, I usually recommend not using notes on a virtual interview. Um, perhaps you have just a few keywords or phrases that you want to remember that you write on a post-it and stick up right next to the camera so that as you're making that eye contact with the camera, you can be reminded of a couple things that are important. Um, but beyond that, it's going to become obvious that you're reading. Um, even if you're reading something on your screen, you'll see the eyes kind of move back and forth, right? So um, probably best to prepare for this the same way you would with an in-person interview in that there probably wouldn't be uh, the opportunity for you to use notes to answer your questions. All right, so those are some of the main things that you'll want to do when you're preparing for the virtual interview. Um, now let's talk about how to prepare um, for interview questions in general. You've, you've got your, your camera set up, your sound is good, your background is great. Um, now we got to talk about the content that you're going to be conveying during that interview process. And there are really three pieces that I like to, to focus on here. Um, know the position and the organization, brainstorm some examples, and then expect some common questions. Know the position and the organization. For all of you who are currently in the job market, job search market or the internship search market, um, or who will be searching soon, one thing that I highly recommend that you do is you create a little folder on your computer that says jobs I've applied to. And every single time you apply for a position, before you click that submit button, save that job posting as a PDF. Just print it to PDF, save it in that folder, um, because what's likely to happen is that uh, by the time they get around to interviewing folks, there's a good chance that that posting will have been taken down. It won't be available on the internet anymore. And especially if you're applying to multiple positions, you might forget some of the details of that, of that particular job or that particular organization. And so if you can go back into your folder and say, okay, here's the job I applied to, um, you can then reread that posting. You can make sure that as you're preparing for your, your interview, you are using the exact uh, qualifications, skills, requirements that they are asking for. And that's one of the big keys to being prepared is if you know what it is they're looking for, you can then make sure that you're preparing your, uh, your answers, your examples, and even some of the questions that you ask them at the end uh, specifically to that role. So review that posting, hopefully you'll have it saved or from here on out you'll get in the habit of saving your postings. Um, so you'll look at that posting and actually what I typically do, and this works for me, it may not work for you, but it, it's sometimes helpful, is to go in and read that posting and just highlight any of the words or, or um, little phrases that stand out to you as being uh, likely important to the employer, likely something that they would ask about. Um, and then I take all my highlighted words and phrases and I put them into a list, and then I'm able to go through that list and make sure that I am ready to talk about specific situations uh, where I've used those skills or where I've experienced um, similar types of um, uh, issues or um, I've had to, to use those particular qualifications whether it was in a job or in a club or in a class, doesn't matter necessarily where I use those skills, but I'm gonna use that list of qualifications to draw from. I'm also gonna make sure to do my research. So I'm gonna know that posting backwards and forwards, but I'm also gonna make sure that I've done some research on the organization itself. I've gone to their website, I know what they do, I know who they are, um, I know, I, I've looked at any news uh, stories that have come out about them, news alerts maybe. Um, so I know what's happening right now with them. Um, maybe I've looked to see if they have a mission. Maybe I've looked to see who their clients are or any big projects they have currently. So that I know what I'm walking into and I'm able to make conversation about that. I also am going to, when I get the interview request, if they don't tell me, I'm gonna ask if they can share with me the names of the interviewers themselves. And I'm gonna do a little bit of research about them. 
Um, specifically, I'm going to go into LinkedIn and I'm going to look them up. I'm going to find out what their job titles are. I'm going to see what they do and start to get a sense of how their roles might interact with the role that I'm interviewing for. And I know sometimes the idea of that makes students feel a little bit nervous um, because in LinkedIn, unless you have your settings um, set differently, people can see when you look at their, their profile. But I will tell you that if you uh, look up an interviewer before your interview and they see that you look them up, what you're telling them with that is that you are taking this seriously, that you're doing your research, um, that, that you are a professional person. So it actually can help for them to see that you you took it upon yourself to do a little bit of research beforehand. So don't get, don't get uh, nervous about that as an option. And then really the other thing that I like to point out about knowing the position in the organization is that you wanna keep in mind the hiring manager's perspective. If you, if you were the hiring manager and you had that job description, what types of things would you want uh, to know about the candidate? What kinds of things would you want the candidate to, to show you as far as their skills and abilities? And if you can keep that in mind, it will help frame some of your answers as we go through this next part here. And the next part here is brainstorming examples. A very common type of interview question is the behavioral question. And a behavioral question is when they ask you to tell me about a time when. Tell me about a time when you worked with a group. Tell me about a time when you had to take a leadership role. Tell me about a time when you failed and, and tell me what you learned. Those are all examples of behavioral questions. And those, type, those questions are looking for your past experiences and your past performances in order to indicate how you might perform in the future. If you can tell me about a time that you were able to work with a group well, then I might be able to um, envision you working well with a group in the role that I would be hiring you for. And if you are anything like me or most people, it sometimes can be hard to think of the very best example in the moment. Um, I know if somebody asks me a question and I have to think of an answer of, of an example of a time when I did something right off the top of my head, I'm probably gonna think of the most recent example, most recent time or, or just the most um, memorable example, but that may not be the best example that I wanna give in my interview. I might have other examples that would showcase skills better. And then if I just had a, a little bit of time to think through it, I would have been able to remember those. So we prepare our examples in advance so that hopefully you can avoid having to get in that situation um, where you just have to think of something off the top of your head. Now there will for sure be some questions that you cannot predict. Um, and there will be a time for you to think of things in the moment, but the more you can prepare these examples, um, the less that's going to happen and the better you're gonna feel. So. Like I said earlier, I look at the job posting, I look at the qualifications and the skills that are listed in that job posting, and I start to think of examples where I've demonstrated each of those skills. And the way that I format my examples is the STAR formula. STAR stands for the situation, the task, the action, and the results. And if I can get in the habit of sharing stories using this model, it's gonna be a lot clearer for me to describe situations and it's also gonna be a lot easier for the inter interviewer to understand what I'm talking about, to understand the full scope of, of the example that I'm giving. So let's do a quick example here. Let's say that I was looking at a job posting and one of the qualifications that they had listed uh, is problem solving. So I'm going to think of an example of a time when I demonstrated problem solving really well that would showcase that as a skill that they could then use um, if I were the employee. I was hired. So I'm going to start with the S for situation. So let's say that my situation is I was hired as an events intern at a large meeting venue. Let's say last summer. Last summer I was an events intern um, at this place that had a lot of meetings. That's, that's the situation. I'm kind of setting the scene. They kind of understand what I'm doing, get the background. Then I'm going to move into T for task. So this is, what was my responsibility? What was, what was the responsibility and then what was the, the problem or the issue that arose? So here I might say that my job, my responsibility was to create the seating layout and, a, and the seating chart for an upcoming event. That was my responsibility. 
Um, last minute RSVPs increased the attendance by 20%. So we needed to create a brand new seating chart with only one week prior before the, the event, only one week to go. That's my task. So I'm explaining what the issue was, what my responsibility was going to be. Then I move into A for action. How did I respond to that task? How did I do that task? So I could say that I worked with the caterer to move the buffet out to the exterior hallway so there was more room within the, the uh, gathering space. And then I was able to also work with uh, the catering uh, team to redo the place settings so we could fit one extra chair at each table. And then as a result of that, I had to re reassign everyone's seating and reprint that seating chart before the event. And then my result, so what? The outcome is that the event went well. All the attendees were able to fit into the room. There was no disruption at the event. No one knew we'd had this last minute switch up at the end. And then I'm probably gonna tell them what I learned, what the takeaway was. So with this example, I might say something like, and as a result of, of this experience, I understand the importance of being able to think on your feet and think in creative ways when you have to solve problems under a quick deadline. And that way, I am ready to answer any questions that come up about problem solving. I have this evidence that I can give them that shows that I'm able to problem solve. Um, and it's, it's an example that I know well and I know how to, to describe so that I don't miss any of the important details. So star formula can be really helpful as you are thinking of examples for those behavioral based questions. So something that I've seen happen a few times is we go through all this great prep of, of looking at the qualifications and skills of thinking of examples um, for all of those qualifications we're ready to go and forget that we need to also prepare for those common questions that are a little bit more simple um, that you're you're very likely to encounter in one way or another in a lot of interviews. And so I wanted to spend just a little bit of time going through this here. Um, one very common question that you, if you've done any interviewing, you probably have had asked at least once, and that's, tell me about yourself. Um, it also could be phrased, you know, introduce yourself or walk us, you know, walk us through why you're here or um, any variation of those. But it's a really important question because it's usually the first question that's asked in an interview. And if that's the case, we want to make sure that we are setting the tone for our interview really well. Um, so how do you answer that? Really, I think of it like in three different parts. Um, the first part is going to be some background info. So you might share, I'm a junior at uh, University of Texas at Austin, and I am studying sociology. Um, you can maybe say where you're from originally if you want. You can share hobbies if you want. Um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't share too many because that's not really the point of the, the question, um, but you can give them a little sense of who you are. The next piece is going to be probably the biggest piece of this answer, and that's gonna be your skills and qualifications. Um, here, I would think of three to six involvements that you've had or skills that you have that you think would be helpful for them to be reminded of right at the beginning of your interview. Some of these things could be things from your resume. That's completely fine. Um, but you're going to do no more than one sentence per skill or qualification. So recognize that most of the things that you mentioned in this interview, you will talk about again later on in the interview. But you're just touching on them now. You're just kind of setting the scene a little bit, reminding them that you have these skills and qualifications that they may have seen on the resume. Um, and then the last piece of this answer is your connection to the position. Why are you excited to be there interviewing with that specific organization for this specific position? And it can be something as easy as saying, based on the description that I've read, I feel very confident that my skills line up well with this role. I've done some research on your organization and I feel like I would be a very good fit. And I'm, I'm so excited to talk with you today about how uh, we might be able to work together in the future. And I, I appreciate you inviting me in to talk with you. And that would be the way you would answer or you would finish this answer. The, way to, the other way to think about this, this interview answer is to think about a movie trailer. And what is a movie trailer to a movie? A movie trailer would be the commercial for the movie 
Um, if you watch it, it's, it's much shorter than the actual movie. And it does not give away the, the plot of the movie completely. But when you watch a movie trailer, you get a sense of the tone of the movie. You can see you know, who the actors are. Um, you get some idea of what the plot might be. And it makes you want to watch the movie. Well, this, Tell Me About Yourself, is the movie trailer to your interview, which is the movie, right? Um, a lot of these things you're going to go into greater depth on. But if this was all they saw of you as a candidate, they would still have a sense of who you are and, and what you're about and, and who you might be as a candidate. All right, so another common question that you might encounter would be, what is your greatest strength and greatest weakness? It, they may ask you these questions separately. They might break it apart. They might ask you for your top three strengths, top, or top three weaknesses. Um, but again, any variation of this strength and weakness question. Now the strength piece, I, I tend to find to be um, a little bit easier for students a lot of times. It's easier for us to think of, of um, what we are doing well because we've been in this mode of applying for a position. So we've had to think about how we're a good fit for these roles, right? And so when you think about your greatest strength, think about what is it that, that really um, sets you apart. If you were to ask your family, friends, coworkers, classmates, professors, what, what is my greatest strength? What's the one thing that they would all say, or most of them would say, what's something that really defines who you are um, when it comes to your strengths? The weakness piece is a little bit um, different, and I, I know that this is something that, that a lot of folks struggle with. Um, what do I say for my weakness and how do I say it in a way that um, doesn't make me sound like I, I wouldn't be a good fit for the role? The trick here is to think of a weakness that truly is something that you, you struggle with. Um, and then we're gonna explain what that weakness is. Then we're gonna tell them strategies we have developed to address that weakness. And then we're gonna give them an example of a time we recently implemented that, those strategies to overcome the weakness. So here's another example. Let's say that my greatest weakness uh, is an inability to say no to things. I tend to say yes to everything. I take too much on um, and I'm unable to commit and, and perform the way that I would like to because I'm just, I'm a little bit spread too thin. Um, my answer, to an employer who asked me about that. I might explain that that's my weakness, but then I'm gonna say what my strategies are. So I might say something along the lines of um, recognize this is an issue. And so I've created a few different strategies to address this. And one that I've recently been implementing is uh, a rule for myself where I won't say yes to anything until I've thought about it for 24 hours. So that would be my strategy. That's how I would explain that. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give them an example of a time when I implemented that strategy. So I might say, for example, I recently had a friend who was starting a club on campus and he asked if I would be the club VP and help him get this club started. And my initial instinct was to say, yes, it sounded great. I'd love to help him out, but I had my rule. So I told him that I would let him know tomorrow. I'd have to take a look at some things. I went home that night and I looked at my commitments for the semester and I realized that I just did not have the bandwidth to um, take on that kind of a leadership role within a new organization. So I went back to him the next day and I let him know that I couldn't be the vice president, um, but that I'd be happy to be a member of the organization and just attend meetings like any other member um, and support him that way. And I was able to feel that in, in doing that, I was supporting him as a friend um, and I was really doing what was best for both myself and the organization. And so that's just one example of how I've been able to implement those strategies recently. And so that way, we're giving them a weakness that's real, but we're also showing them that we are self-aware and that we are working on developing strategies so that that weakness um, is not as much of an issue as it may have been originally. What salary do you have in mind? So this may come up. Um, if it does come up, you certainly want to make sure you are prepared for it. Most of the time you're going to be talking salary when you get into the negotiation process, once you have an offer. If you have questions about that negotiation piece, I encourage you to set up an appointment with your, your college's career center to ask them about how that, how that works. Um, but in the interview itself, you may get asked this question, what salary do you have in mind? Um, so it is really important before you go to any interview, whether it's a first round interview or it's the final interview, that you have done some research. Um, 
There are many free salary calculator websites online. I recommend you use more than one to get a sense of what a range might be. And then if you are asked this question, you do want to provide a range. Don't just give them an exact number. And the way that I would phrase it if I was asked this question um, would be to make sure that I explain where I got the numbers for the range and to also leave it a little bit open. So it could sound something like this. Um, I've been doing a little bit of research about what these types of positions in Austin or whatever city I'm interviewing in um, typically, typically offer. Based on that research, I'm thinking a range of 50 to 55,000, but um, I know as we continue to go through this process, I'll learn a little bit more about the position. You'll learn a little bit more about my qualifications. And so as we get to know each other better, I um, will be able to come up with uh, a range that truly reflects my abilities and this position's responsibilities well. So we're still leaving the, the, the answer open a little bit, but we're giving them a, a number. We're giving them an answer here. And then finally, the last question they're probably going to ask you is what questions do you have for us? Always make sure that you have an answer to this. Um, the research you've done about the position and the organization will help you to form some questions. But what do you want to know based on what you've read and what you've found? Um, it's, it can be really helpful to use questions about projects or clients that they, they have coming up. Um, to find out how this role might help support those goals or support those clients. Um, if they have any big initiatives that you think would be really fascinating to learn more about, you can ask them about that. Some general questions that might be helpful would be to find out more about the, the culture of the team that you're interviewing for, um, asking them how success in this position would be evaluated could be another really good one. So think about what it is that you want to know um, in order for you to make a decision. Because in the end, remember, you're interviewing them and they're interviewing you and you need to know if it's going to be a good fit. So ask them what you need to ask them. Um, but do make sure you have questions ready to go. And unlike your notes um, for your interview answers that you probably should not have during the interview, if you have questions you've prepared, you are more than welcome to have those written down and to pull that out when they ask you um, what questions you have. So you don't have to memorize all your questions. All right, so those are some of the main ways that you're going to prepare for specifically virtual interviews, but then also just interviews in general. Um, we're going to move into the Q&A here in just a second, but I do want to point out a few other events that we have coming up this summer that might be helpful for you. Um, later this week, we have three more webinars. Tomorrow, our office is offering a graduate school planning webinar. So if you're thinking about grad school, um, you can have questions considering it. Uh, down, the, down the road in the future at some time, please feel free to register for that one in Handshake. On Thursday, we have a webinar that will focus on how to showcase your transferable skills for our virtual world. So again, talking about how the job market is changing a little bit based on us moving into uh, more of a virtual interface. And so you'll be learning more about how to market yourself as a candidate in this kind of an environment. And then on Friday, we have a great webinar set up um, that's going to help you talk, learn about how to manage your stress during the job and internship search. There are a lot of really stressful things that are happening in the world right now, and, and looking for a job on top of all of it can be a lot. And so this is an opportunity to learn a little bit more about um, what are some strategies that can be helpful for you as you go through this. We also have some great opportunities for you to engage with some amazing employers. Starting this Wednesday, uh, there is a um, employer virtual office hour with Informatica. And then the following Wednesday is Charles Schwab. And the Wednesday after that, the 8th, would be the city of Austin. Um, all of these employers are employers that are currently hiring here in Austin. They are ready to answer any questions that you have and to engage with you about how to be a really competitive candidate for their specific position. So if you're on the job search, I recommend that you sign up for, for all of these. Um, Informatica is a tech company here in Austin. Uh, the individual who will be representing Informatica is actually very well connected in the tech industry in general here in Austin. And so if you're interested in tech at all, definitely make sure you make it to this, uh, this office hour on Wednesday. 
And then throughout the rest of the summer, there are a few other fun things that are happening. Um, we will have weekly groups that you can attend. Um, you can attend one session, you can attend all of them. But on Tuesdays, our groups will be meeting to talk about um, that job and internship search stress and, and developing resiliency during these challenging times. Um, and then um, on Thursdays, we'll be offering a mindfulness and career slash major exploration group. So it's an opportunity for you to chat with a career counselor and some other students or young alumni who might be um, going through some similar things as you. And just to get some tips, to get some um, strategies in place. And then also, we have drop-in career conversations that um, are an opportunity for you to just hop on the Zoom link with a career counselor and ask any questions that you have, um, any, any brief 15 minute or so long conversations that you wanna have with a counselor about uh, resumes, cover letters, just general application questions. You can do that without even needing to schedule an appointment. Um, so all of these events are available in Handshake. Sign up for whichever ones um, you think would be helpful for you. We'd love to see you uh, engage with us throughout this summer. So now, the moment you've all been waiting for, let's go ahead and, and see if we have any questions. Um, oh, there's a question about how to sign up for the um, information uh, that I mentioned both before, the employer office hours, and all of these are available in Handshake. So the same place that you signed up for this webinar, you just go to the events um, and you should see for the 17th will be Informatica um, and you can RSVP right there. I'll also mention that the employers from these three organizations recently did a webinar um, and that is actually available within uh, the registration for their office hours. So you can watch the webinar, hear what they have to say, and then ask them questions um, in person during these events. Uh, this recording will be available. Um, we are going to hopefully send it out after uh, the webinar is complete. So probably within the next day or so, you should receive a link. And then it will also be available on the Texas Career Engagement YouTube site as well. Um, oh, here is a really great question. Um, I'm not sure if I missed it, but how should we take notes during a virtual interview? Or should we not because it looks like we are reading? That's a, a great question, and I think it is. A, it can be as simple as saying to the employer, um, I'm just gonna take a few notes, especially if you've asked them some questions or if it's the beginning of the interview and they are sharing information about the position, it is completely fine to say, I'm just gonna take a few notes while you talk here. And that way they know what you're doing um, and it won't look like you're reading because you're right. If I, if I have something that I'm writing right here, you can't necessarily even see that my arm is moving, right? Um, so they, they wouldn't necessarily know. So. Remember, they're humans. You can absolutely let them know that. Um, okay, so I'm thinking, okay, this is a great question too. Is there a way to properly address the fact that we are in the middle of a pandemic or crisis at the beginning of the interview without making it awkward or taking too much time? This kind of goes back to my last answer in that we're remembering they're humans too. And just the same way that you would, um, just the same way that you would make a little bit of small talk with them at the beginning of, a, of an in-person interview, you are more than welcome to do that um, in this in this medium in the virtual world. So, as far as not taking too much time, I think you kind of want to want to watch what they're doing. Um, and I wouldn't just go on and on about, you know, oh, this has been so difficult. Oh. This is what's happened to me as a result of the pandemic or working virtually. But I think it's completely appropriate at the beginning to just say, thank you so much for interviewing me virtually today. I know this is probably um, a little bit different. It, I know it's different for me um, to not be able to engage with you in person, but I'm, I'm um, excited to, to get an opportunity to, to chat with you virtually, even though it's not the most ideal circumstance. And I think that would be a great way for you to and have set the scene to get started. Um, and then if they choose to engage and ask questions or share like, oh yeah, this is what's happening with us because of COVID um, or because of work from home. Um, again, follow, follow their lead a little bit on that. And again, what kind of small talk is appropriate so that you don't take too much time? 
that a little bit depends on how long the interview is scheduled for too. If it's a 30 minute uh, interview, probably only a minute or two of small talk, um, if even, but if it's an hour and maybe there's multiple interviewers on the, on the other line and it seems like you know, they want to, to engage with you a little bit informally before the interview begins, then it might be for a, a few minutes, maybe you know, three or four minutes they want to see who you are as a human, right? They want to know you can do the job. They want to know you have the skills, but they also want to see you know, what would you be like as a coworker? Um, can you make conversation? And so being prepared to talk a little bit uh, informally at the beginning is really valuable, but let them take the lead a little bit on that as well. Um, okay, can you talk about personal situations or situations outside of work in behavioral questions? Um, for example, if asked to talk about a time you overcame an obstacle, would it be okay to discuss it in an academic or personal life context? Um, I think the answer to this is absolutely yes, especially for students. Um, some of you may have a lot of work experience and some of you may have not any work experience. Um, you may have a lot of experience in the classroom or you may have experience doing research or being involved in different organizations on campus um, or in your community. And all of those are completely fine to pull from examples. Um, I would be a little careful when we talk about personal examples um, because you want to remember that you want to keep things appropriate. And um, I, I was working with a student a few years ago and when I asked her, tell me about a time when you um, faced an obstacle and what you learned and she told me about um, how she had recently broken up with a, a romantic partner and um, we talked a little bit more about that and, and decided that maybe that wasn't the most appropriate example to give in an interview. Um, but there, you know, you can pull from academic experiences, you can pull from other situations that you've had. It does not have to be from a work setting specifically. All right, are there any other questions coming through? Are there fairs or sessions specific to certain roles? So that would actually be a great question. Um, for your specific college's career center. Um, you have access to them. You also have access to us at Texas Career Engagement, but if you're looking for something really specific to your industry or your field, I would recommend that you check in with your college's career center. Um, you should be able to find them fairly easily if you search on the, um, on the Texas Career Engagement website. We have a list of all of the different career centers and you can go in there and find out if they have anything scheduled. Um, coming up that might be helpful for you. Okay. And I think we might be wrapping up here. Um, oh, just to clarify, what's the best way students can make use of TCE during the year? Um, that is a great question. And I think one of, the, one of the things that we do really well is we help with career counseling. So if you are having questions about what you wanna major in um, or what you wanna do for a career, um, we have career counselors on staff who can work with you to look at your values, interests, personality, and skills and help you determine what might be a good next step for you. Um, we're also going to be doing programming throughout the year like we're doing this week. Um, with these types of webinars. And so strongly recommend that you, you stay um, tuned in to Handshake. All of our events will be in there. Um, and like I said, we will be posting our webinars and some other virtual resources on our website and on our YouTube site. So not a bad idea to be checking that out as well. All right, I think those are all the questions we have. So again, thank you so much for listening today, um, for joining us. As I mentioned, please feel free to schedule a mock interview with your college's career center, or you can schedule that with a Texas Career Engagement if you are, not, are unable to get in with your college career center. Um, but it's just a great opportunity for you to practice some of these skills before you have to use them with an employer. All right, everyone, I hope that you stay safe and healthy out there and um, good luck with your job search. <laughs>